Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to bring you all the next episode of Common Ground. And with me is my co-host, Dave Hamilton of the America's Futures series, and our guest today, Angela Paget of the Libertarian, chair of the Libertarian Party. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit more about um, what kind of stuff you do for the Libertarian Party. So I'm the chair of the national party, essentially like the chairman of the board. I do board governance. Uh, we set the tone, the direction. We decide financial goals. We set the craft. We we craft messaging, and just the general order, you know, of of the party and the direction. Hmm. And there's a couple different questions I want to jump from that. But what does that entail on a daily basis? Like, what do you find most of your schedule end up being? My schedule, well, I'm in staff meetings, you know, every single day. I deal with the accounting. I deal with the financials. Every single dollar that's spent or, or goes into the into the party's coffers is, is seen by me. I approve every dollar that's spent. Um, I work on marketing campaigns. I decide political projects. We have a big billboard project going right now to get anti-war billboards in the congressional districts of some of the worst war hawks in yeah. Congress and Senate. I'm curious, what's the geographic location of the top war hawks? There's got to be some like underlying, my specialty is anthropology. So I'm curious on a purely like anthropological basis, I guess um, somewhere they'd be concentrated in the South and especially Absolutely. Like Texas, Tennessee, uh, Scots Irish diaspora. We've got a billboard right now in Mitch McConnell's district, in Lindsey Graham's district, and in Dan Crenshaw's district. Oh, so it's the Deep South. That's that was that was my second guess. Um, yeah, that part of the country is the longest like military heritage behind it, and um, Austin and I have a shared interest in that of um, like different American regional cultures. Um, but what do you see as the future of the Libertarian Party? That's a really broad question. Uh, I think Answer it that, however you like. Sure. I mean, let me think about that and really dig into that. You know, the party's been around for about 52 years. Hmm. And from my perspective, it's been in perpetual startup mode. It's mostly been run by good meaning activists who don't have good business sense. They don't have good vision for the party. And they're unsure where they're taking it. They just know where they're not taking it. Yeah. So right now we're really we're really dialed into where we're taking it. We are very focused on local elections. We're focused on having the national party be like the the mouthpiece for libertarian philosophy and and policy, but bolstering our candidates and campaigns at the local level. Yeah. We are really interested in grassroots. We have adopted a low time preference strategy. We think, you know, we need to stop chasing after the next two-year election cycle we need to develop infrastructure it's okay if we can if we uh, retract a little bit right now financially uh, the number of candidates so on and so forth because we've got to put in the work to be successful 10 20 years from now so angela you know i've, I've watched the libertarian party for some time and at one point one of your strategies was to get as many of your rank and file to run for office as possible and that, that was a, a big push. I remember in, in the, well, I'm old, so back in the heyday, you know, early yep. days, excuse me. And you're saying that maybe strategically you're looking at a different, maybe more targeted approach. Yeah. Um, and that was that was an effort to fight above your weight class, right? Um, the Libertarian Party, yeah. the third party, this is a very strong two-party country and just breaking in has been challenging. So that was a strategy to try to fight above your weight class. And, you know, if you follow some of the um, uh, stuff from the 60s, the Sololinskis, et cetera, and how to... Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of fight a little warfare when you're outmatched, outgunned, etc. Um, I'm wondering if any of that kind of thinking um, is effect is 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 uh, sort of impacting your view for the future and how uh, you can gain ground. Because unfortunately, the Libertarian Party, while many people agree with many of its principles, they don't take it seriously enough because they see it not really as viable in terms of winning elections or winning um, you know uh, places in, in in Congress in particular. So let's actually let's back up a little bit so that I can really make you. And I give you like a good picture of this before you want to like talk about where we're going. We should talk about a little more on where we've come from and what's transpired recently in the party. I was part of a takeover. I've been in the party since, you know, active, active in the party since 2016. 
And in the summer of 2017, something called the Mises Caucus was formed in reaction to the cultural left drift that the party had had and uh, just uh, that we didn't agree with the vision of direction. In 2018, former chairman Nicholas Sarwark said that he wanted to run as many candidates as possible. He wanted a thousand candidates running at one time across the country. We, we had 800 something candidates running. All of our resources were stretched thin. Nobody had enough campaign volunteers. We lost our House of Representative seats that year. We had uh, someone in the state Senate in Nebraska, and we had two state um, House representatives in New Hampshire, and they all lost their elected positions. It was just not a good strategy. And my perspective was that we need to, we need to, pump our campaigns full of volunteers. We need to have less campaigns. We need to have serious campaigns and we need to start at the local level so that people can build political capital and be taken seriously. And not everyone agrees with me. A lot of people think that's controversial. They want to run as many candidates as possible. World set free in our lifetime. Lots of slogans, catchphrases, very little substance in my opinion. I am a strong proponent of asymmetrical warfare. I've read rules for the radicals. It is not all applicable to the Libertarian Party or to or to conservatives either, because there are a lot of tactics and things that we just fundamentally morally disagree with. But there's still a lot that we can learn. And doing asymmetrical warfare is a really is a really good example. That's that's something that I pull out. I do a, I do we do a lot of military tactics too. So for example, I can't compete with Mitch McConnell and Joe Biden. I like I don't have the numbers to do that, but I can work to take them out and chisel away at their morale. So we have this big campaign right now where we've threatened to file for conservatorship over both of them. It made national headlines. It was hilarious. A lot of people donated and, and it got the national conversation reignited, talking about at what point are you are you too old or are you too ill to hold office at the federal level? Um, so that's the kind of fun stuff that, that I want to do. I think Alinsky would be proud of you for that and sort of under rule 13. So well done. Yeah. I mean, you know, when he was asked where he would organize, you know, if you could organize any place, you know, where would you organize that? So he said, I'd organize hell. So I'm not really interested in doing that. Um, you know, that would be where we disagree a little bit, but, uh, I'm happy, happy to file conservatorship. Okay. Well, he did, he did dedicate the book to Satan. So we're, we're in a little disagreement with him on that. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so I love your strategy. Um, I, I spent quite a bit of in strategy, quite a bit of time in strategy with various consultancies. And yes, um, you know, uh, applying your resources wisely where they can have the most effect just makes sense. I don't recall. I don't, I don't care which party you are. That's so why I, I tip my hat to you on that. And you've tried it a certain way for a while, and that has had a certain amount of success. So you know, it's probably time to try a new strategy. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. I'm curious. I'm going to ask this question again. What is the highest geographic concentration of libertarians in seats where you think you can win or these seats where you have the highest asymmetric advantages? The highest concentration, well, it really depends how to answer this. California has over, you know, 30,000. There's over 30,000 registered libertarians just in L.A. County. But L.A. County also has 11 million people in it, you know, so we have the highest numbers there, but not the highest concentration. New Hampshire has a very high concentration, but they're not all registered as libertarians because when the Free State Project was born, people from all over the country moved there. Some registers as Democrats, some as Republicans, some as libertarians, some are just non-voting anarchists, but they intend to take it over government culture, you know, by any means necessary. We did have an elected representative in Wyoming, Burt Marshall in Wyoming, culturally is very amenable to libertarianism. But then obviously right after he won, he was he was redistricted out of the race. The, the two major parties didn't like that. So, you know, Austin, Texas, is you'll we find time and time again, and that's where I'm located at that our social media metrics are are the highest here. People are the most interested in what we're doing culturally here. That adds up because for me, uh, I think libertarianism in my YouTube channel would have a significant overlap in their target demographics. And Texas is the place in the world 
that is the highest GDP per capita of fans of my YouTube channel. And yeah. where I grew up in Pennsylvania, an hour outside Philadelphia, I think um, libertarians polled as being 10 to 20% of the population. And that's a big part of the culture there where there's a concept that no one has a right to tell you what you can do with your, your neighbor doesn't have the right to tell you what you can do with your land. And that's yep. a big concept. And there's a lot of stuff about hunting and it's a very naturally libertarian culture. Um, so Angela, one thing I'm struck by is I know hundreds of, not maybe even maybe a thousand people who have told me over their life that they have libertarian, libertarian leanings. Okay. They, there are a lot of things about the Libertarian Party that they agree with, that they side with, that uh, that uh, resonate with them, et cetera. But they don't want to go to the step of calling themselves a Libertarian. And I can see that. That seems to be more of a practical matter about can we win, just make, making my vote count. I think there are a lot of people that they felt that Libertarians were really, really viable, especially in, in wherever they're voting. They would they they might con they might convert. They they want to vote for Libertarian principles. Yep, and they view themselves as largely libertarian, but they've assigned themselves to one of the two parties. Yeah, it's a branding issue for sure. You've got electoral failure as a big part of our reputation, which is you know damaging at the polls. It's going to take quite a bit of movement to change that. It's just, and and that's why I think the the presidential race is a fantastic sig um, mechaning signal. Signaling mechanism, sorry. Um, we need it to maintain ballot access in several states, but it's just not where we need to be putting all of our manpower and our, our hopes and dreams. It's just going to take time to to regain people's trust and to give them something to look at and say, look, we made we made a win here. We made gains. Like, you know, invest in us more. Invest in us at the polls. I mean, um, I'm not going to make these completely analogous models, but if you look at the history of other organizations that were movements that tried to, that felt that started small and grew, et cetera, throw up against the laws. I mean, if you look at the Muslim Brotherhood from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, they have a long-term plan. If you look at China, they have a long-term yep. plan. They focus their energy effort uh, and resources on those things that they think will have the most uh, um, the most um, pay payoff, and they're willing to invest long-term. And I think that may be something that you're looking, this is something you're advocating for, is that we yep. have to long-term Rome wasn't built in a day sort of thing. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's really challenging because we have so much turnover with the board of directors. It's like every two years, every four years, there's a major shakeup. And there are so many disagreements in the party, you know, on the direction. Should it be run by activists? Should we professionalize? Should we be pragmatic? That it's difficult to make long-term progress. So that was another big part of the takeover. So it was like we have to we have to take over not just at the leadership level but at the membership level, so that we elect the same board of directors with the same vision, you know, over and over again, and that we have a succession plan and, and continuity. Yeah, well, um, Rudyard does a lot of historical work, and he, he looks at people like the Scottish, the Celts, et cetera, and how they sort of squabble amongst themselves, and how yep. that kept, has kept them from achieving maybe what they could have achieved. I'll yep. let talk about that, but it seems to be that you have a lot of passionate people who care deeply about this, but they can't seem to come to agreement on how to achieve their goal. Absolutely. It's um, it's interesting where there are certain very small groups that can basically have a stranglehold in the public consciousness, and trans people are an example. Trans people are 0.1% of the population. We have more Salvadorian Americans than we have trans Americans, but um trans issues are a national topic of discussion and they're pushed by much larger demographics jewish people are two percent of america's population but you wouldn't realize that because their influence is so outsized beyond that and yep. like sure they'll get a lot of spicy comments on youtube but no matter what side of the political spectrum you're from i think we can agree to that or um you find very like Los Angeles, again, or Hollywood. Hollywood is filled with a couple hundred thousand people at most, but it completely influences global culture. And so um, Nassim Taleb talks about how if you have skin in the game and can basically develop a group with a very strong incentive structure to propound its interests everywhere, you yep. can massively outperform um, what you're capable of. And the South is an example of this, where Southern states have historically voted together so for so southern agriculture has gotten a lot more subsidies 
than Californian agriculture, even like there are less people in the states of the deep south than there are in California. But the southern states have worked together on that. Um, but the problem with libertarianism is because it's based off liberty. It's difficult to develop mm -hmm. that fanatical base that will continually propound your cause at all times. And I think the attempt to get everyone to run was a proxy for that, but it didn't hit that same result. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting that you would mention um, Jewish people being 2% and, you know, being in charge of things. Uh, I, It's, we're like the party of Jewish economists. We love uh, Murray Rothbard, Ludwig yeah. von Mises. There's a lot of Jewish economists. Like We're like obsessed with that. But we don't adopt the cultural cohesion of the Jewish community. And it would behoove us to do so because they have been so successful. And I think it's because Jewish people, like they, they take care of each other. They encourage people to do like to, to be the best, achieve the best that they possibly can. Right. They they have high expectations and they help one another solve those expe expectations and they stick together throughout history. And when I look at the LP, we don't necessarily behave the same way. Like we don't treat each other well. And uh, you know, the inherent values of liberty, I would call these sort of people eagles. Eagles don't flock together well. Right. This independent mindset, it, it's, it, it's it's very much like uh, Scottish chieftains. I mean, me, mine, whatever. And they want to be left alone, et cetera. And they don't flock together terribly well. They don't, uh, they're, they have, they have, you're the antithesis of the herd mentality, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's challenging. I like that a lot better. Sometimes people will say, oh, it's like herding cats. I completely reject that paradigm and framing, though, because from, from my perspective, we can do really great things. Um, and we're not cats. You know, we have a lot of really qualified, highly intelligent individuals. We have to learn how to work together. Uh, I, I don't think cats is a good analogy, but maybe herding eagles. That might, I have a story. That might herding eagles. Okay. I have a story that illustrates this point. Um, there's a lot of backstory here, but I was once at a water park with 10 tech CEOs and they couldn't, uh, you had to put your phone away. And so you couldn't bring it to the water park for obvious reasons. Yeah. Everyone kept on walking in the, the, their own direction independently because they couldn't stay with the group because that would be an insult to their ego. But I was thinking to myself, you guys know that if you get lost from the main group, this is a giant water park. You will never see each other again. Yep. And, um, there's like no map and stuff. And so it was incredibly infuriating to think you guys just need to stick together, but you can't do that. That so is a good core, analogy. So there's some core values that unite the Libertarian Party. And I'd love for you to speak to those a little bit, but it seems that like some of those things evolve and change over time. One of those is this anti-war sentiment, right? You guys yes. very, very strongly, we don't want to be involved in every single uh, fight and everything. We're not the, the policemen of the world, et cetera. We need to do that strategically. There's a sort of real politic uh, view that you all have, which is let's be practical about this. And, and I get all of that. But what's really interesting about the Ukrainian war that seems different is that the hawks have changed. In that particular war, um, it seems that uh, the Democrats, more so than even the Republicans, are very, very pro Ukraine, don't want to hear yep. anything negative about them, et cetera. Don't want to question where a single dollar is being spent or if it's being wasted, et cetera, and are and have no interest in talking about any kind of a, a, a negotiated withdrawal and going back to the pre-war status where there was no Ukraine in NATO and no Russia in Ukraine. And bringing that up and negotiating has, uh, for many, many people on the left, has been, a, 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 been a, the equivalent of appeasing Hitler, right? And, and well, anyone who brings it up is vilified for saying, hey, maybe we could stop the fighting here somehow. Right. Sure. And yet they'll do the, the opposite thing with the Israel war, Israeli uh, conflict right now in Hamas. They're saying, hey, I know you were attacked, but hey, let's have a ceasefire. It, yep. it seems schizophrenic. Well, I mean, there are reasons that both parties, you know, have chosen their respective sides to back with the Democrats. Uh, Russia Gate is something that was drilled into the Democrats' head. You had Hunter Biden and involved in Burisma Holdings over there. There was a lot of corruption in Ukraine, and Democrats are very incentivized to cover that up and to continue carrying the narrative that Donald Trump is in collusion with Russia and election interference to take down America. It all seems really absurd to me, but they've already been invested in that narrative, and it is too much of a leap to to switch and and do an about face and. 
who knows? Maybe there's some some very bad, damning things there that they have to cover up. It's really hard to figure it all out um, when there's so much propaganda. Focus on what drives it. What is driving that? Those narratives, those deeply held beliefs, yep. are what drive those decisions. Russia Gate, you know, uh, the well, thing, and Hillary losing the war because of Russia and Facebook ads and all that kind of stuff. They truly right. believe that. They they think. absolutely do. I also just think the population's psychotic. If I'm honest, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think people have deep repressed hatred due to a bunch of reasons and they demand an external opponent to like let it out on. And it's not rational because people are beyond rational at this point. And so that's why people will cheer on Hamas killing, killing Israelis. That's why people will bloodthirstily say that like um, chanting about paragliders. Yeah. Or talking or even the Ukraine must die. And I personally don't support the U.S. going to war over Israel. And the reason I say that is I don't think we can stomach it. I think we're so divided that if it we like as a person who is Gen Z and part of my job is to know other guys who would be in the target demographic that would be drafted Mm -hmm. is would massively backfire. I don't think we could fund it. I don't think our society could stomach it. And if we do it, China will attack Taiwan. And the thing that scares me is how rapidly if we wanted to have a war, it would just happen. And there, like, like back in the day, you actually had to have Congress approve a war. Now the president just does it. Right. I think that that was a shift that no one thought about, but it's one of the most important shifts in American political history. And um, yeah, and there's just not enough thought that goes into these giant political these giant political decisions and people politi- uh, mistakenly believe that these decisions are made on all rational basis as opposed yeah. to the rational they're emotional. emotional decision yeah um, they're emotional the, the, the libertarian party though is against all of these rules. It, yep. uh, okay so every single one regarding regardless of who's involved is it a fair statement to say that you would you want to be as isolation as possible without being <laughs> stupid about it i mean isolationism is a little different i want to have peaceful foreign policy I want us to have open and free trade, even in countries that don't like us. Uh, I th- and I think there's really because good reason we tend not to kill each other if we do business. Yep. Again. When goods, if goods don't cross borders, troops will. I I don't think that it's a good practice for us to be sanctioning and embargoing all of these countries that seem to have you know ideologies or practices that are that are in strong conflict with the United States. Um, now, would you agree that you should do that when people cheat economically and, and in trade? If they're if they're cheating in trade, then you I mean, fight what is economically. cheating in trade? This well, is a real question, question but it illustrates an extreme example. Would the Libertarian Party of today have supported America's intervention in World War II? No, it's split, but I wouldn't. So I believe that accepted. the Communist Party in Russia had already won most of the war. And the British had turned a corner and were starting to beat back the Russians. And I am no fan of communism by any stretch. Um, but I am a big fan of understanding like history and reality and giving credit where credit is due, because I think that's how we learn. There are definitely points, though, where physical force is necessary. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But if you draw a philosophic line like that, where do you draw the line where you do use physical force? I think it's it's a case by case basis and there's no perfect answer and you've got to use your best judgment. I think that we were within our rights to respond with uh, military force to the attacks at Pearl Harbor, even though I think there's also a good chance that people knew those attacks were coming and didn't do the right thing to prevent them. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to get dragged into a full scale ground invasion in Europe. Those are those are very different things in, in my mind. Okay, so um, I do want to unpack that a little bit. I want to understand. You're saying that um, you would have been against uh, American yeah. uh, intervention in World War II, siding with the Allied powers, et cetera. And to the extent that we did, yes. To the extent that we did. And and the outcome would have been different. Russia would have taken over much more of uh, Eastern Europe, right? And all probably all of Germany, right? And and that would have been an, an outcome that you would have been okay Maybe. with? Maybe. I think that that would have been much more... What's what's the right word? I think it would have been a better idea to engage in diplomacy and back allied powers in a different way as opposed to like a ground invasion in Normandy. 
Yeah. I think that you can have, and the showing of strength with the with the atomic bomb was probably enough to keep Russia from invading um, and taking over the rest of Europe. And Patton was making a a run as fast as he could, and the Russians were making a fast as uh, going yep. as fast west as they could to carve up as much territory as possible. Yep. Um, and uh, so it's really interesting. I, I'm not quite sure what I, I mean. What about to... dropping troops there much later just to protect? and stand down Russian troops and, and then sending in a diplomatic envoy and, and trying to carve things out that way instead of instead of carving up so many bodies. Yeah, this is where I deviate sometimes from being uh, sure. what I would like to call left of center. This is where I'm a hawk. Uh, I, I find diplomacy doesn't hasn't worked for us very well. We've we've tried to talk our ways out of all, all kinds of conflicts, et cetera. And invariably, the rest of the world doesn't care, give it. They only care about power. Uh, Interesting. That, that's that's been my take on history. Um, you, know, you know, rights and 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 what is right seems to be only uh, what you can keep uh, through the barrel of a gun. Unfortunately, that's where I'm a bit hawkish. I think Russia would have taken over much much of uh, of Europe, and today may even have taken over all of Europe if we had uh, not um, if we had not uh, stopped. Them. Interesting. Yeah, we're we're very much for peaceful foreign policy. You know, I'd like to see even a two state solution. With with Israel and Palestine, I do think it's possible. Um, would that be the Gaza? Would that be What's giving that? them? Would that be giving them Gaza? Absolutely. I I would I would absolutely let the Palestinian people have the have the place where they're living. Um, and wall it off and give them their own country. What incentive do the Jews have to do that? I mean, the Jews militarily occupy the area. You know what incentive they would have if the United States would pull out all of its foreign aid. That would help start sorting your own problems out because we're not though, giving you money uh, anymore. Is that if you did that, that the hatred, animosity, and the desire to drive the Israelis into the ocean would go away. That that, that would take away that um, that drive. That would I don't think it would entirely take it away at all. I think it would incentivize them to start working on solutions to their own problems instead of outsourcing part of their military to the United States, which is essentially what they do. And they're not the only country that does it by any means. Over well, the I, like the, I like the domino thing that you're doing here, which is, okay, if this, then that. If you were to give them their own country, then the idea is the angst and hatred, et cetera, for is Israel and the West, and America in particular, would be diminished. Uh, the issue, though, is I think for many uh, fundamentalist jihadists is that if once Israel is destroyed, the caliphate hasn't been, hasn't been established, and there's still work to be done, which is to make all of the infidels Muslim. And if not, they need to perish. I mean, I know uh, two Muslims who believe that. I mean, Osama bin Laden was really clear when he attacked on 9-11 why he was doing it. We were over there. We mm -hmm. were killing innocent people. We were meddling in things we shouldn't be meddling in. And it was decades of anger and resentment and, and United States interference that led to that. It was awful. And, you know, what Hamas did was awful. And I, I wish that I wish that people were were able to say that a little bit easier people who defend palestine come on we can say that it's wrong to murder women and children um but i do think that we just put way too much you know emphasis on on the good part quote unquote that the united states military does in the middle east i mean we've had decades of of involvement over there the war in afghanistan was a failure so was the war in iraq over the course of human history the longest periods of peace have been due to a single empire having so much power that it makes it uneconomical for other factions to not wage war. And whenever you remove a single empire, you get the law of the jungle. And the things that you're describing have been occurring in the Middle East for thousands of years without America. And so I know that America is not the instigating factor. And the policy that you described could work for the US because we're so isolated. But even so, like you would, that would let the Confederacy get independence, which would then cause another bunch of wars. But for most countries in the world, they can't afford this kind of thing because their neighbors would conquer them. I mean, I think that we're also at a place, though, in history where there are more incentives to be on good terms with a neighboring country than there were in the past. Global trade and commerce are are off the charts now it's it's like nothing that ever existed before with the silk road or or whatever you know this is we have a lot more good incentives to work with each other and i don't think that things are going to necessarily be perfect and we can't like there is no utopia right like we can't account for 
every decision that people make, we can't force everything to be to be good and on good terms. But I do think that the more history marches on, the less bloodshed and conflict there is. Right? Isn't it a oh, isn't oh, it the I, best time to be alive? I absolutely agree with the strategy and 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 the, and, and the basic statement that less conflict is good. Uh, clearly. And that America could, in fact, withdraw itself and not be embroiled all these things and not spend the treasure and the mm-hmm. blood that it spends on these things and the political capital that it spends, et cetera. But uh, if you play this chess and checkers out, it seems to me that if America was no longer a presence in the Middle East, things would uh, play out. And clearly, I think that the um, the surrounding countries would drive Israel into the ocean. And if you're OK with that, you're OK with that. And from a realpolitik perspective, that's actually probably better best for the United States because the other nations have oil. Russia and China don't care about Israel because Israel doesn't have oil. They care about the natural resources that uh, the Middle Eastern countries have, and purely selfishly, they care about that. If we were to withdraw ourselves, I think there would be no Israel. And then the next step is um, the Muslim countries, if they're controlled by extremists, will continue in their mission to take over the world. Just like communists have a mission to take over the world, Muslim extremists have uh, have a mandate to take over the world. They're just like thinking in the brain. They wake up every every night thinking, you know, how are we going to take over the world? I'm not convinced that they would actually continue to take over the world. I understand the the mandate of holy jihad, you know, to the extent that I can as someone who's not a Muslim and, and that whole thing. Um, but I'm not convinced that they would continue to wage violent war on us because I don't think that that was something that they were really doing aggressively in the, the first part of the, the 20th century. They have talked about it. The Muslim Brotherhood has, has had a plan to do that since the 20s and 30s, before 48, when Israel was established. Mm-hmm. It's always been their plan. They've worked on this. I'm not a Muslim. I did read the Quran, and I considered um, converting uh, back in the day, back in the 60s, in the 70s. Um, and I don't know just about enough, I guess, to be dangerous. Um, and there is a huge schism between certain Muslims and uh, mm-hmm. the, who are largely not, maybe even as a Huron, I don't know what the word is to say is, but the, they are not as fervent about it. And those who are yep. absolutely dedicated to the cause of creating another caliphate and having all people on the planet being become Muslim, they, they absolutely are dedicated to that. I heard you loud and clear about Osama bin Laden. You know, he he was upset because Americans had despoiled uh you know, by our simple presence, had 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 despoiled uh, their land, and uh, we had troops on the ground in Saudi Arabia, and we mm-hmm. hated that. I get that, but I don't think the ultimate end game is if we give them what they want, they will be fully appeased. Osama may have been. I'm not persuaded by the evidence yet. You know, I guess it remains to be seen, but I'm I'm not persuaded by the evidence. I do think, though, that the longer we are over there, the worse we make things. Um, Maybe it's possible through diplomacy for Israel to start working things out. There are decades and decades of, of, you know, conflict that they'd have to overcome. There are Palestinian people who say, you know, my family was driven from their homes. You have put me here in this place. I cannot leave. I have a right to be here. You have a right to be here. It's, it's really complicated. You know, at a certain point it gets into the colonizer argument and, you know, as someone in the United States who, I am a white person. I wasn't born, you know, or I was born here, right? My, my great, 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 great parents, grandparents weren't born here. Um, Eventually someone crossed a land bridge thousands of years ago. They weren't born here either. It's really hard to to sort that out, right? At some point there's a statute of limitations and we just got to let it go. I appreciate you're saying that because ultimately the decision is should Israel have a nation state or not? And that's the really the fundamental question. Should And I think they should, they should work to persuade more people why they should. I really do I, I think don't, that they should. I don't believe in the moral arc of history. And I say that because the bloodiest wars and the bloodiest tyrannies in history have occurred within living memory. And the reason that we have so much peace now and the reason that we have an incentive for countries to work together is due to the American empire. Because any country that attacks the world system, the American system will be destroyed by its giant alliance. And the reason I say that is right before, within living memory, Everyone was grabbing up their own parts of the world, the Japanese, the Germans, the British, the, and then that stopped once America became so powerful. And then now that America is being torn by internal difficulties, you're immediately seeing the Russians go after Ukraine, war in the Middle East, China go after Taiwan. 
And so I, I don't agree with the theory that in most, most, when most people say diplomacy, they don't mean what that actually entails. Using diplomacy to maintain peace means launching coups in other countries or getting your opponents to fight wars against each other. That's the sort of thing that um, countries have historically done with diplomacy and the things we've done with sanctions and stuff and using international press have frankly been ineffective. Well, as someone who's been I, in a lot of street fights, there's a point where talking doesn't work. Uh, someone who's had his butt royally kicked on the street, either, there's a, you can talk all you want, but if somebody really wants to kick your butt, they're going to do it, and talking doesn't help. And for the Israelis to try to justify their existence, I mean, they think that the uh, the, the point is, is self-evident. We have a, a historical tie to this land, et cetera. Other people have theirs. We should have one, too. And for them to have to justify that and continue to, to persuade people that they should exist when others don't and they think they should all be driven into the sea. Um, I mean, I don't know how much more talking you can do. The only way for them to stay alive is to continue to have a strong military um, and, and rely on allies like the United States. I solemnly believe that if the United States was not involved, Israel would not exist unless mm. they were willing to use nuclear weapons. Mm. Well, I just contend that it's not so much of our problem anymore. Um, oh, that's and, interesting. And, and that's a good point. So th this is the point I wanted to get to, which is yeah. if we make that decision and we could, because out of a, um, a, a self-interest, our own self-interest, we could we could separate. But we just have to be prepared for that eventuality. But that's the likely outcome. And then Dipl if we're okay with that, then we're okay with that. And as a matter Diplomacy of fact, more oil. It also involves deal making and trade. It's not just, you know, do we back you or not? There's a lot of give and take. There's trying to find out what people want. What do you mean by X, Y, and Z? You want this and that. I mean, the Middle East is like the most complex one. Taiwan would be something probably much, much easier to, to entangle this. The Middle East, there's thousands and thousands of, of years of bad blood and competing religions and, you know, things of that nature. It was really interesting. Um, how you how you said, Roger, that you don't subscribe to the the moral arc. arc. I think that with the rise of the American empire, you also saw the rise of free markets and capitalism across the world. And I think that that was one of the things that has lifted people out of poverty and also enabled us to have less global conflict because I think free trade is a really important um, element to peace and, and getting along because it incentivizes us to behave um, and get along with one another. When it comes to Ukraine and, and Russia, I mean, there were so, there were years of conflict in that region as well in the, in the Donbass, um, Donbass. And that is also similar to the Middle East. That's an area that's been hotly contested, you know, not for thousands and thousands of years, but maybe for a hundred years. Um, there are people who live in that region who believe that they're Russian, you know, and they want to be annexed and they want to live with with Russia. And, you know, of course, there are plenty of Ukrainians who say that that's fake news, so on and so forth. It's like it gets to the point where it's like, look, I don't know, man, Like, uh, you know, my heart goes out to you, but it sounds like you got to sort your sort your own problems out and not try to wield American military might as a cudgel against your you know, cultural enemies. I don't even know if political enemy is the right word at that point. Like it seems so much more deep rooted than that. Um, and I think what you're saying is really important there because the simple fact that you said that in some circles would get you canceled. Oh, for sure. Well, I'm canceled. You know, there's, there's hit pieces written about me all over the internet. I'll never work another corporate job again. So someone has to say it. So I'll follow. And I, I agree with you here. I don't support America's roles in many of these foreign wars right now. I don't think we should have war over the Middle East now. I think we're probably giving too much money to Ukraine considering our massive internal difficulties. And I'm saying that on a strategic level where our, in my opinion, our society is falling apart in front of our eyes Yep. and we're focusing on these foreign conflicts as a way to ignore our own internal issues. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's very, my concern is that as we move closer to the election season, we're going to see like, you know, quasi 9-11 repeated. Yeah, I just, um, I just finished writing a video and recording a video about this where I said, every president in American history over the last century who started a war got reelected. Yep. And I can imagine that Biden, who's looking at what would otherwise be a pretty contentious election. I mean, I think a lot of things are going to happen in the next year. Might think, hey, 
if I start a war that rally around the flag effect um, could be the thing that pushes me over. Yeah, I, I worry about that too. Yeah. I, I well, think it's possible. For me, Angela, is I want to compliment you because we've just had a very interesting nuanced conversation where we don't agree 100% on every single aspect of it, or maybe not to the same degree. We may agree largely, but not entirely. And what I find interesting when I talk to people who are libertarian, they can do that. They can yeah. have those kinds of conversations. Their heads don't explode, and they don't want to stab you with a, a pitchfork. And we need we need way more of that. And if America is to survive this coming uh, various crises that we, we look like we may have, we have to be able to pull together and not attack each other. That was the lesson for me out of COVID was COVID was awful, but what was worth was we just tried to destroy each other. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, I, I agree. And, and I appreciate it so much, you know, being able to have like an open, interesting dialogue where we disagree and then you can kind of walk away from it going, hmm, you yeah, know, like that was interesting. Let me look into that more. Oh, that was a good point. I should refine my argument on X, Y, Z. Like, I think that's, We've kind of lost in America the ability, maybe the capacity to have civil discourse as yeah. all the stakes have like risen. And it's just because we all feel it's the most important election of our lifetime. Every four years, it's the most important Democracy election of our lifetime. Stake. Democracy is at stake. Hide your grandchildren from your grandparents. Punish them if they don't vote the right way. It's all kinds of terrible things. Uh, we just need to be able to talk with each other like you know, and recognize each other's humanity. I'm really passionate about issue coalitions and the anti-war coalition work that I do, I think is there's like, you know, it's like peeling an onion, right? There's, there's layers of significance there. I think pushing back against nuclear war is the most important thing that you can do and that it transcends left-right politics because there's no economic theory in nuclear winter. But it, what it also does is it brings together this, this microcosm, which is growing, you know, of people who are far right, people who are hardcore libertarians. I'm an anarcho-capitalist, right? No government. I just want to be like the little monopoly man, you know. And uh, I work with literal communists, card-carrying members of the Communist Party. And we are able to set aside our differences. And we say, you know what? I, I oppose I oppose like America's involvement in this war. I don't want to see nuclear winter. I want to have a future for my children. We'll sort out our other differences afterwards. This and so, so, so if you have a single issue and you come together on that, I found that most people, reasonable, even if they call themselves communists or right wing or whatever, are able to work out a scheme or an approach and yep. come to a solution if they can take the politics out of it. Yeah, yeah, and that's why it's got to be really narrow in scope. You know, we put together these big anti-war rallies in D.C. The last one we had was called Rage Against the War Machine. And our next one on President's Day weekend is going to be Defeat the Deep State. And I work with people who are very far left, not the typical left, you know, but but far left. Communists, socialists, um, just like hardcore anti-war activists, old school left. And we all get together and we're like, you know, like we're going to agree on like five things, right? Abolish the CIA. Free Julian Assange. No U.S. involvement in XYZ wars. Uh, in forever wars. And sometimes people might have a different idea about, you know, like, what does it mean to be defensive? And so I'll say, okay, we're going to just kind of take that out of what we're working on. And we can have disagreements and debates on that, you know, like in a group chat. Uh, and then we just go to town. To the how, you have moved to the how of each of these things. You agreed in principle on the goals, and the vision, and the priorities. Yeah. And now you're willing to roll around in the mud and argue out about each of the, the specifics. How do we come to terms with each of these issues and, and, and come to a solution? That doesn't happen. Most people, uh, the, most of the discourse in America can't even come to a fundamental agreement on, yeah. the, on the principle, on the point, on, on the goal. Right. It's, and so they're fighting all it, the time without being even able to get to, well, how would we do it? It's some of the most rewarding work I've ever done. You know, at, at our rap party after the last rally, we had we had 3,000 people show up to the rally, plus, you know, just like regular attendees at the Lincoln Memorial. We had a big rap party where everybody who worked on it attended, and then we sold some tickets to the general public. And you had people there with BLM shirts. You had hardcore climate activists. Everybody was willing to set aside their, their differences, and, and we were just hugging each other and just like, thank you so much for giving me a chance. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it and really nuclear, changed the way the, I the see it. The nuclear one is the best example of all, of all of these. I have been heartsick about the like the the sort of 
the easy way people banter around the idea that we could go, we could have World War Three. They're so yeah. casual about it, et cetera, right? And to your point, it is the single biggest issue we should worry about. And I can't tell you the problems I've been interviewed or I've seen interviews with people saying, so how close are we to World War Three? And I go, the fact that we're even talking about it and not curling up in a in in a ball crying about it is insane. Yeah. Yeah. I think social um, media. I think we're completely numb. Like I think mm-hmm. for um we spent way too many of our emotions over Trump and COVID. And now we're just incapable of feeling anything now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but a point I want to throw in here is according to John Height's metrics, where he, I think he's one of the most important scholars of this century. He created cultural foundations for the three political parties. And um, what he found, and for a little bit of flattery, libertarians score the highest in IQ and rational thinking of any of the three political parties. Yeah, uh, and they are influenced the least by their emotions. And then there's purity, which is purity is a system of how much you are gathered around what are often irrational shared values and how much that galvanizes your group dynamic. And one of the interesting things over his research is that the Christian right used to have much higher purity 10 years ago. And then the left went from having almost none to by far the highest of any demographic in America. And so um, I find that interesting because uh, (laughs) you see it on the left where they'll support something that everyone knows if you spent five seconds researching is completely wrong, but they need it to maintain in-group cohesion. And um, the libertarians have a certain degree of flexibility because they are, they're the only Inside the right, there are certain sub-demographics that think rationally and other ones that don't. And the process that you describe, I see it on the right, where there's lots of people in the new right coalition where they could be members of the American Communist Party 100 years mm-hmm. ago. They have the exact same platforms. And it's, and I mean, I, I think it's like almost anyone can agree, we don't like the deep state. But like, it's difficult. There are things we share that it's very difficult to galvanize the public behind. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and this boils down to intellectual honesty. And I, I find that to be true of libertarians that I know. They don't lie to themselves. They don't kid themselves. They're practical. They're pragmatic about these things, et cetera. Right. Is this, would you think this is a fair statement of when you describe the, the people that make it your party? What, what I think is rational, not generally speaking, most libertarians do not have strong emotional responses to the, to the, to the news. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe during COVID we were all extremely, extremely outraged at what was going on, but, but typically we are not guided by our emotions. Um, There is a degree of purity, but we don't necessarily hold other people to that standard, if that makes sense. So it's not really the same way that Jonathan Haidt, is uh scoring it um low disgust that's something i think that came out of jonathan height you know like i'm not offended by how people in the middle east live it's really none of my business they're just going to do their thing and go about their thing i don't care not offended by prostitution to the degree that i am it's like i scroll through social media and i see it i'm like and then i just keep going it doesn't impact my day one of the points um I'm friends with her husband. And one of the points we were talking about is how one of the most winning strategies for libertarians would be to um, build coalitions with other groups that share their values that are larger. And so an alliance that we've seen across Western history is an alliance in Christians and libertarians. And on its face side, that doesn't make that much sense because although these terms, this is not an accurate characterization, but Jesus was in many ways a socialist. But Christianity indirectly create individualist values that kind of are jive with libertarianism. And that's an alliance that you've seen form in the new right, which has also pulled it away from its classical. It's made the right a mix of Christian and classical liberal. Um, But I, I frankly think liberty is not a strong enough motive is if you want to speak to the public, liberty yeah. can only speak to, I think, about 10% of the population. Yeah, no, you have to be solution-oriented at this point. I think 100 years ago, 
speaking about individualism and liberty was much more popular. And now people have been, you know, coddled and so pumped full of fear and complacency that they need to have their needs met. They need someone to do it for them. We've outsourced it. A hundred years ago, my family, my family, uh, my mom's side immigrated from the coast to the interior over, um, over uh, American history. And so a hundred years ago, we had, my family literally remembered clearing the frontier and um, that's not the society we live in. And we have right. all these social pressures towards conformity because we live in a giant industrialized society. Too, um, yeah. And it's sad to see. Um, it's it's really sad. <laughs> um, now that's a change. The other change though, that might make your coalition work better is I think people will agree that Christianity in America has changed and is far less judgmental less yep. fire and brimstone than it was yep. in my youth. Um, yep. I was always being told I was going to hell growing up. And uh, now I think uh, many Christians are fairly libertarian and that they go, you know, that's not my bag. You do you, I'll do me. I don't agree with maybe your lifestyle or your choices, but they're not condemning uh, of others. I and almost so- never run into someone on the new right who judges psychedelics. Um, among like, especially outside the Bible belt, Young, younger people on the right and Christians are much more tolerant of psychedelics or weed or that sort sure. of thing. Sure. So one of the one of the projects I'm working on for, I guess, a year from now, next September, after the big anti-war rally, is is a is a project called Defend the West, and it is an anti-war effort. But there are, there are some other issues too. You know, pushing back against technocracy, the military-industrial complex. Uh, we're just calling it sort of the industrial complex project, uh, unofficially the medical industrial complex, you know, issues with free speech and technocracy. And and that is something that we're working more closely with the right on. Um, so, and Christians too, certainly. We have a lot more Christians in the party now than we did um, four years ago. One of the goals of the takeover of the Libertarian Party was to just make it a place that's a little more welcoming to Christians. It doesn't mean to make it a Christian party, but if you were to, for example, look at the social media and marketing and promotion materials for the party in the past, you would find lots and lots and lots of emphasis on LGBT rights. You would never find anything on a homeschool win, on a parental um, sovereignty, authority, anything that was advancing individualism or liberty in a way that just wasn't more libertine. And now we've sort of expanded that and we're saying like, look, that's great. You know, these people have a uh, farm to table slaughter riots or we need to work on raw milk legislation, things that are just like slightly more wholesome. Yeah. It's interesting. Most libertarians I know are also Christians and it's like yeah. a tab I keep in my head. Well, <laughs> um, and I mean, I think it's because Christ was actually like a big proponent of, of individualism and, the, and yeah. that the Christian, you know, church like really propelled like the sovereignty of the individual through Western culture. Definitely. That's thing I've talked about a bunch in my videos, but um, I mean, the homeschooling thing is thing I find really interesting because I've seen this as an underground social force that's really vaccines and homeschooling are two yep. very libertarian sentiments that have recently popped up right of center um, because, and I find them really interesting as social trends because they're both very libertarian sentiments that have spread among large parts of the population. Um, and for homeschooling, it's not something I, like growing up. The, the assumption that I had was that people who homeschooled were kind of strange. And then over mm-hmm. time it became seen as a, a completely wholesome and reasonable path. And yeah. I think that that demonstrates a distrust of traditional authority. Absolutely. It does. Public schools are one of the most violent places a child will ever encounter. It's one of the places where you're most really? likely to encounter physical violence. You may never encounter physical violence in your life again, but the degree to which you might get bullied and beat up in public school is quite frightening uh, when you compare it to the rest of a civil, sane American life. I also had a personal experience. I went to 11 different schools, and by the time I got to the 10th grade, one guy didn't show up to beat me up because somebody killed him before he got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah libertarianism but, yeah public so, schools no, it was a very violent mixed. place and and it, it, it it's gotten better and there's all this anti-bullying thing etc but um the the other notion of school choice and having vouchers and being able to use your money where you want to is also another sort of libertarian uh, mm-hmm. ideal 
that uh, that many Christians uh, go along with. And it seems that the Libertarian Party and the movement is having influence on the thinking of a whole yeah. of lots of others, but they're not benefiting from the political clout that they that you would think they would get. They're influencing others, and others are becoming more libertarian. But they're not, uh, you know, the Libertarian Party itself. Uh, hopefully, maybe under your uh, on your uh, leadership, et cetera, will expand its influence, et cetera, and some of the really great ideas and principles will become more widespread. But it just seems that others are sort of uh, indoctr or in, um, taking on uh, some of these principles, et cetera. We're behind the gun a little bit, but it'll 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 take a little time, and we'll catch up. At least we've been first on the anti-war front here. Yeah, um, ideologically and philosophically, you're you're at the forefront of it. Yep, you're leading. And I I know most young men do not want to have a war. I go on Twitter, and that's just the overwhelming sentiment. Oh, for sure, um, no one wants to go to war. There's no Gen, Gen Z draft is not happening. Mm -hmm. It's it's yeah. not going to happen. I mean, they may they may issue it, but it'll be the most colossal failure. Well, You'll yeah, see. It only works in the South, from Texas to the Carolinas. Eighty percent of all those who ever served live from the Texas to the Carolinas. And 80% of those had a family member who served. So there's one subset of the United States population that carries the load for that. And it's not in California. It's not in the Pacific Northwest. It's not in the Northeast, et cetera. All the Midwesterners serve too. There's, yeah, even so, but if 80% of all those who ever served live from Texas to the Carolinas and they all had family members, 80% did, that's a very condensed group, et cetera. And the rest have no stomach for it. And, and, yep. and the people that from the South, the people who have family members to serve, and I come from a military family, um, we want no part of that either. I mean, people have passed it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's culturally it's unpopular, and I think that's such a good thing. One of the things that shocks me is I'll see um, I'll see very elitist statements made by very powerful organizations, and I work in media, and I just cannot believe that people with far larger budgets than I said that. And it's it's just I can't believe a lot of the things like um one of um someone recently tweeted a list of legitimate articles and let me read them out. This is from mainstream newspapers. Um uh, it's all stuff like why you sh why questioning the government is okay, here I am. It's time to, this is from the slate, it's time to give up on facts, or at least temporarily lay them down in the favor of more useful weapons, emotions. Um, questioning authority has become too much of a good thing and it's killing people. The New York Times, don't go down the rabbit hole. Critical thinking as we're taught to do it isn't helping in the fight against misinformation. Forbes, you must not do your own research when it comes to science. And I'm thinking, these guys have massive budgets. They know this. How could you not know this looks horrible? And I think of the World Economic Forum and that whole tier. Like yeah. I'm from Philadelphia. That's a city with horrifying crime problems. And George Soros was funding campaigns there against um, against police, police presence. But the thing yeah. is, the first people to tell you that would be a bad idea would be mainly people of color in those neighborhoods because they know how bad crime could be. And I mean, the World Economic Forum and eat bugs and everything. And it just shocks me that this tiny deep state that I think, like if you pulled them on these separate issues, you couldn't get more than 10% of the population behind them behaves in this manner that the vast majority, in this elitist manner, that's like something you'd hear about mm -hmm. from some like uh like incredibly authoritarian state um that the majority, north korea it's yeah, north the korea vibes population doesn't mm -hmm. want it yeah it's interesting yeah. that earlier you mentioned the deep state and almost everyone would agree that it's bad the people that don't they won't phrase it as though it's bad they'll say that's a conspiracy theory they don't think that it doesn't exists. exist there is no quote-unquote deep state meaning but no they're the ones that'll eat the bugs yeah they'll eat yeah. bugs yeah no, no entrenched interest. I mean, if you call it entrenched interest, maybe they'd go for it. But it, the term deep state, they recoil and horror at. It, it doesn't yeah. exist. The only people that support it are those whose jobs heavily depend upon college degrees in large coastal cities. I think academia, even, like even if you went to your average Hispanic or black person, they would say, yeah, that's insane. It, it can't. Oh, be, certainly they would. Yeah, yeah. They, be they've been, been told to vote Democrat and to to vote for xyz policies but they're not interested in any of that like government 
bureaucracy and deep state. It's just program yeah. related and it's it's voter conditioning. Resource related. And it's resource to be frank, there are reasons. enough legitimate racists on the right that it's like I understand if you're a minority why you would continue to not vote Democrat. Sure. Not to well, it only takes a Democrat. few. It only takes a yeah. few bad PR moments. Um, and, and that's, that's it. Yeah. Well, California did it long before the rise of wokeism. California in the 90s, the, the GOP lost the minority vote because they went too hard on immigration. They did what they called charge the cockpit, um, you know, campaigning. And they were like, we're going to go hard. We're going to change it. And it just turned everyone off. And they, they lost everyone that way. And it may not have been, you know, like overt racism, but it doesn't matter because that's how it came across, you know, and the rest yeah. is history. Now it's so blue, it's practically red again, a different kind of red. So uh, so uh, we try to keep this to about an hour. I'd like just to do a time check. Where do you, where do you think we are, Roger? Do you think it's uh, time to maybe uh, ask a couple of um, follow-up questions or uh, questions to wrap things up? Um is there any specific point you want to end on, Angela? Is there anything that you want to get across in this interview that uh, you haven't already? Yeah, you know, I think I think that libertarianism is really essential to defending and furthering the best values of Western culture. Agreed. And when I when I've worked on this rally that's coming up in a year called Defend of the West, I've been working on it with Brett Weinstein and and mm. a man named Matt Toon who worked on the Defeat the Mandates rally in D.C. Uh, people ask me, you know, like you're working on one with the right, you know, like what what's your message to the left on this rally that you're working on with the right? And And the way that I see it is sort of like that parable of you have two wolves. You know, what do we want the West to be? remembered for we have two wolves you know one is the enlightenment and the furthering of the pursuit of truth and individual rights and property rights and free speech and the other is american militarism and bloodshed in the middle east and the failed uh, legacy of the war on terror and which one do we want to be remembered for which one is is going to win it's whichever one we feed and I want us to be remembered for the incredible Western values that have advanced our society, not for ruining other countries. However, most societies in history would, put, would pick a glorious empire over freedom. I'm going to pick freedom. Um, yeah, I'd take freedom over an empire, too. Um, ironically... It might be possible, and this kind of, this it might be schizo on my side. It might be possible to build a coalition with the communists because they hate. I see this from my YouTube channel. Communists hate ma the mainstream left because it's yeah. completely abandoned class relations, and um, <laughs> and so for a very transitory um, alliance against wokeness, you could see a coalition between libertarians and communists. It's called diagonal unity on the political yeah. spectrum. Mm. Yeah. Um, hmm. it, it won't last long because one group does like control, wants to be authoritarian, wants to control the lives, et cetera, and, and thinks it knows best. So the end, it, it would it would not last long, right? This like it's yeah. brief. It's brief. But in that brief moment of working together, my hope is that we can glimpse each other's humanity. And if communists ever take over, maybe I'll be the last one against the wall. Uh, communists don't do that. They don't do humanity. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we're trying we're trying yeah um okay so this was a pleasure thank you very much you're thank so you. welcome thank you for having me of course i will stop the recording <laughs>